a four-time Tony Award winner, winning three of them before the age of 30 makes her a rare find. From musicals to plays, from show tunes to classical, she's found success across the spectrum. Additionally, she's acted in film and on television and has had a rich recording career. And now she's tackling opera. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on this episode of Interviews, our conversation with multi-talented Audra McDonald. approach something as a singer as opposed to an actress what goes on differently in your mind nothing really? I approach everything exactly the same way um, because almost everything I'm doing um, the, the projects I pick are basically always character driven and even if it's just an evening uh, a concert you know where it's just me singing a bunch of different songs on stage I have to invest in each song as if it's a mini monologue or a drama or you know comedy, whatever. I have to approach it from um, a character-driven place. So I approach everything the same way. Why am I singing the song? What am I? What, what does the character want? Where is she coming from? What's just happened? Yeah. Where is she going? How? What kind of research do you do then on a stage show? Is there anything there? Or is it still dependent on what the lyric that's already written there says? Oh well, you you know the composer and the lyricist are God in terms of what is there. You have to do what they've written, but you do as much background research as you possibly can. Um, with something, let's say, like uh, uh, La Voix Humaine or, or Send, the two operas being done at Houston, I, I, I would do something, uh, well, like with La Voix Humaine, I researched all of, of Poulenc's sort of life, and especially during the time that he was writing the particular piece, um, I learned a lot about where he got a lot of his information for the piece. A lot of it, uh, along with Cocteau, a lot of it came from his own life and the actress, singer that they were writing it for, Denise Duval, their own personal life. And um, So then when you take the role, mm -hmm. what do you bring of Audra to that character? Or well, are you trying to respect what was done before? Oh, well, you're always trying to respect what was done before. I mean, but... It, I think just by nature of each different person that interprets each different role is going to, you know, um, portray that role through the filter of their own life. I, I, I don't think I'm um, sort of a Stanislavski type of actress where I try and, um, you know, call up a past memory and then plug it in to the yeah. piece. That doesn't really work for me. Um, I think more of what I do is just try to you know, what if is a very powerful thing. What if I were in this situation? What if this was 1958 and um, I was of a certain age and my lover of five years has left me and my prospects were dim? What, what would I be feeling like? What would I be wanting? What would I be trying to accomplish? So the characters that you're playing then, either on stage and film and television... Do we learn about you, the person, through them also, do you think? Audra McDonald, the yeah. person? Well, yes and no. I think some people, I think because of a lot of the work that I've done, a lot of people think that I'm um, a very dramatic person. And, <laughs> and um, my sister uh, is a television writer, and, and uh, she, uh, the people she writes with um, have this image of me that I speak like this, and I say, Alison, come to tea with me or something <laughs> like that, just because usually the roles I play are high drama. But... Um, it's just, you know, it's an aspect of what's inside my own emotional psyche, but it's not all of me. Um, I think I was certainly a very emotional child growing up, and so I have that to draw from, and, and to all that sort of, the, the availability of my emotions, <laughs> I have that to draw from when I'm, you know, going into each of these characters, which if, is helpful. If I know the story correctly, you are a hyperactive child, and instead of doing something medical with that they gave you projects to do and yes my puts your energies yeah. that direction my parents uh were really against the idea of ritalin and um they were both educators and um, my uh all my aunts were singers and my grandmothers were both piano teachers and they knew i had musical interests and abilities so they just sort of um sort of threw me into that but it was all stuff that i wanted to do yeah which but you important. were so young when you started it all. Yeah, I was I was uh, eight, I think, when I started at the you know the local dinner theater, and then I happened to be growing up in Fresno, California, at a really good time. There was a, they were experimenting with a 
a, a performing arts junior high school and a performing arts high school. So I was able to attend both of those. And so yeah. instead of physical education, I had, you know, jazz and ballet. And my electives were, you know, Shakespeare or, um, you know, in the older classes instead of, you know, English, I would have, you know, you know study of Shakespearean literature or... Um, you know, uh, introduction to theater, piano lessons. I had all of that every single day at school. That was, you know, it was an incredible education to have at that time in Fresno, California. Right. And you've gone into that. This has become your life. But do you ever look back and say, what if? Would you have still found this path? Would you have gone somewhere else? I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't become a performer. I mean, I, I imagine something, but there's nothing else that I know how to do. Why do you get that smile there? No, I just I was just thinking about the fact that I can't cook and um, <laughs> so chef is off the list. Yeah, that's off the list. Unless you know, I bet I would learn to cook if I had to play a character who cooked. I'd have to learn. And in fact, I did when I was doing Raisin in the Sun and we first started rehearsal. Kenny Leon said, "Okay, Audra, so you know, we start off. She's you know, she, Ruth gets up and she needs to start making eggs. So." And I just sort of froze. <laughs> and he said, so, you know, let's just, you know, let's sort of improv. Just go to the, the stove there and start making eggs. And I just, so I went over and pretended that I knew, you know, and I, you know, I'm not that dumb. I know you crack an <laughs> egg and, you know, just yeah. to scramble it. And everybody stood there for about five seconds and Felicia Rashad said, oh, girl, no. And so she got, she said, come here. And she said, time out. And she took about 20 minutes. She said, you get milk, you get, and she, Talked me through it. <laughs> Said, now we can start rehearsal. So. so can you make scrambled eggs now? Oh, I'm good. I can make them on stage in front of thousands of people now. Can you make them though, alone for two people in an apartment? Yeah. No one likes my eggs at home now. No. <laughs> no. Another story I heard about you when you were a child, and you were so young and you were in King and I. Uh-huh. And that you weren't there for all the rehearsals because you were so young, you went home. Yeah. And it wasn't until the final dress that you found out what happened at the end. <laughs> Yeah, but I found out that the king dies. <laughs> you didn't know it. I didn't know because I was just one of the little princesses. It was my beginning of my adventure in colorblind casting, I guess. You know, little Siamese princess. And I just started crying right there on stage. I was like, oh! You know, I had no idea. We were all, you know, in the big royal room at the end. And I, he was in the bed and he just... And then he died, and I, I literally just <laughs> sobbed on stage. I guess it was the first time I cried on stage. You know, I guess they might have thought it was in character, but for oh, me, it was a just, wonderful actress. Oh my gosh, at nine years old. So, yeah. <laughs> that oh, which well. brings up a point for me: young people being involved in theater. You're up on stage when this happens, and you get into it. I went and saw a show on Broadway a few years back, in which obviously the inner city school kids that were there had probably never seen a show before, mm-hmm. and they were involved with what was going on talking back to the actors and all this. And I saw people in the theater, regular theater goers, I'm assuming, shushing them or quieting them and seemed so upset mm. that the kids were getting so involved. But mm-hmm. I would think that's what you as an actor want. Absolutely. You know, I certainly had a lot of experience with that during Raisin in the Sun um, because it was, the audience we had was, it was very diverse. It was a lot of people's first time in the theater simply because they were coming to see P. Diddy, you know, mm-hmm. Puffy, Sean Whatever. <laughs> Puffy. I call him Sean. Um, but uh, they were coming for the first time. And so, you know, for them, theater it w- was, you know, either a concert or a movie or television. So the, they didn't quite know how they were supposed to act in the theater, but they were still having a, vis- a very visceral reaction to what was going on. You'd hear people when, when, he, when um, Walter admits that he... Uh, lost the money, going, oh, man, no, no, you know, just, re- I mean, right. and yeah. I, that was moving to me. It meant that they were really into it. You'd see real tough guys at the end of the show, like, wiping their eyes when they're trying to applaud, you know, which is just, uh, that's a wonderful thing. And when I was doing Henry IV on Broadway um, a couple of years ago, we would have uh, high school uh, or school audiences on matinee days, and... Um, you know, there were stars in the show. Ethan Hawke was in it. Ethan Hawke played my husband. Kevin Kline, and Richard Easton, all these wonderful actors. You know, and that's a very uh, bloody and sexy and dramatic show, Henry IV. Um, and the audience would get so into it. And it was four hours long. And they'd scream during the battles and all during, like, the, <laughs> the, the sex scenes with me and Ethan. They would woo and all that stuff. <laughs> But um, our director said, enjoy that, because that's what an actual, true Shakespearean audience in the day 
would have reacted like they would all know it. They would all scream at the actors, especially, you know, not only being caught up in the action, but if they didn't like the way the actors were performing, they would right. scream at them in that way. He said, that's a true Shakespearean audience, so enjoy it. And we did. It, it would really pump us up. You so often hear people say theater is dying. and I would think at moments like that you realize, uh-uh, there's still this new fresh generation that's going to come. Sure. I don't think, you know, I don't think theater will ever die. It's a part, I think, of the human condition in a way. I really think it's sort of necessary. You know, if you look back at the Greeks doing these incredible, uh, you know, you know, Oedipus and Antigone and all this stuff where, you know, or Medea, mothers killing children, you know, sons marrying mothers, all this stuff, you know, it's, it was cathartic for a reason. You, you'd get all that experience without having to actually go and do those things yourself. It was sort of necessary, I think, as a release and an escape for um, people. And so I think that, will, that need will always be there. Um, it's important to continue to bring new audiences to the theater so they can recognize the importance of keeping the institutions that are, you know, perpetuating this art alive, thriving, and healthy, yeah. you know, and, and especially in this country where we're not as supported by our government as far as the arts is concerned like other countries are, you know, there's, other countries are certainly um, in much better shape as far as the arts are concerned than we are. We really have to look to private donors and to, you know, commercial producers and things like that. Um, so it's important just to continue to keep you know, the audience aware and educated and, and um, uh, into theater as an yeah. art form. How did you go from being in Fresno, California to New York? What was the move and the moment when you decided that's the direction you're going to go? I, I was always going to go to New York. You I just you, knew it? I, was al- I always wanted to be on Broadway. That's the only thing I ever wanted to do, so I, I was just going to go to New York, <laughs> you know, and, and the deal with my parents is, well, you're going to go to school, so, you know, if you go to school in New York, that's fine. We can't stop you um, as far as where you go to school, but you will get a degree um, since they were uber educators. So I, um, you know, I set out to audition for schools in New York and got accepted at a few, but got accepted at Juilliard and thought, well, I better, I better go to the one that's the best, um, and that's where I went. Yeah. Yeah. Being at Juilliard, though, as I understand the story, you didn't get that much experience in what you want. You were close to the theater world, but not in the theater world. Yeah, I was in the wrong department. You know, hindsight, you know, we're on our path for a reason. If I hadn't have been in the classical voice department, I never would have discovered that I had a classical voice, and um, I never would have discovered that part of my voice. Um, but the whole time I was there, I was hanging out with the acting students and the dance students and, and just frustrated with my teachers that they wouldn't let me belt and wouldn't let me sing, you know, <laughs> just one Jerry Herman tune. Come on, just, you know, and just that they're... they're I'm sure there wasn't, but in my sort of, you know, sort of clouded and blurred vision that there was just this snobbery towards Broadway. And, and um, it, was, it was almost like, you know, a kid sneaking off to do what they're not supposed to do. I would sneak off and do summer stock and all the stuff I wasn't supposed to do as far as the classical teachers were concerned. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it has served me well um, in my career. Every time I'm asking you questions, I see you start to answer, and then you get this smile, and I know there's something else you think you get. You're having these moments. I, that we, in terms of, well, no, I just, I, you know, as far as that, just thinking the hell I put my teachers through, <laughs> and vice versa, I'm sure, you know, that, well, yeah, the hell they put me through. We, you know, we all butted heads uh, in my years at Juilliard. Um, but I think about my career. I think about the fact that I was able to do Sharon and Masterclass, which basically... Terrence McNally certainly didn't write the role for me. He didn't know me when he was writing the play. But there, there, it, was, it was as if he studied my life at Juilliard yeah. and, and wrote it. So, you know, talk about, you know, actor meeting a part where it just was, you know, a student that was sort of misunderstood at a conservatory getting a chance to sing for a diva. And, you know, it was there, you just couldn't, you couldn't have, you know, Taylor made a better part for me. So if I hadn't have gone to Juilliard, I would have never been able to you know, do that role right. and understand it as well as I did, I think. Um, and, and just also with learning about vocal health to sort of survive on Broadway. Broadway's very difficult with eight shows a week. Yeah. When you got done at Juilliard, 
did you know then you're going to just be doing Broadway initially? Did you know that was the direction you were going to go after having all this classical training? And granted, of course, master class was a wonderful melding of mm -hmm. the two, but was there a part you felt you were cheating yourself out of what you had been training by going and oh, doing this? Oh, no, I just no? left. <laughs> Not <laughs> at all. Gone. In fact, when I, when I left school, I was already, uh, I had already taken some time off from school for mental health. And... Um, Instead of going straight back to school to finish up, I, I got uh, a part uh, in a national tour of the Secret Garden. So I, you know, did that, then went back to school to finish up that last semester, do my final recital, and um, went straight back out on the road with with uh, the Secret Garden. Got my you know equity card all squared away, and while I was on the road, I got the call to come and audition for Carousel. So I just I headed to Broadway and didn't look back. <laughs> What's the feeling the first night you walk out on a Broadway stage? Is that a pivotal moment for you in your life? I'm trying to remember it exactly because my Broadway debut was in a very tiny part in Secret Garden. I was able to do that on Broadway for a couple of months before I got Carousel. And yes and no, it was sort of, oh, I'm on Broadway, I'm standing behind... Rebecca Luker and, and Howard McGillan, and I'm singing in Hindu. It's not <laughs> quite the Broadway debut I had imagined, but I'm here. It was sort of, you know, enjoy it, enjoy it, that sort of thing. Um, but the first time the curtain rose and we were doing Carousel, and it wasn't even my life is about to change. It was just this... Um, it was one of those moments in time that's completely frozen. Just I remember grabbing Sally Murphy's hand and hearing the first few chords of the carousel waltz and just knowing that something electric was about to happen and that um, my life would forever be altered. Not that I'm, I'm going to become a star, but my life would right. forever be altered by this moment. So. At a moment like that, do you reevaluate then what your goals are? Because I would think up to a point like that, you're thinking... I want to make it to Broadway. Mm -hmm. Well, then when you make it to Broadway, then what do what? you think next? You know, <laughs> staying. staying on Broadway. That's harder. That's harder. Making it to Broadway is very difficult. Staying on Broadway is even more difficult. First Tony Award. Um, pretty amazing moment. I once again, I it was a it was a blurry. I only have a very few memories of the night specifically. Now, one was, um, for some reason that year, they decided, you know, all the different shows would do their biggest sort of company numbers and then stand on stage as the, the winner of the Best Revival was read. So I remember <laughs> um, us, I think we lost. No, we didn't, no, we didn't lose. Yeah, we won. I can't remember. I think we won. But I just remember all of us being on stage holding each other's hand. And then I had about six minutes to get dressed, to get back into the audience for my, for my category, and I don't even remember getting dressed. I don't remember getting back to the audience, and I don't remember my name being called, but what I do remember is when I got up on stage with this Tony, I remember looking in the audience and seeing just anyone who I'd ever admired my entire life being in the audience and just standing in front of all of them at, at Radio City and... Uh, the, so nervous. It wasn't even one of those things of, oh, I've won. It's like, oh, my, I have to talk in front of all the... I didn't even think about the TV audience. It was just, who am I... And I was very, very nervous, and I looked down, and I saw Carol Channing in the front row, just with this <laughs> grin that went from, you know, from one end of the theater to the other. And it calmed me down. <laughs> and I just... I almost did the entire speech to her. It just... She just calmed me down. Yeah. And those are my biggest memories of that night, actually. And then eating a cheeseburger after. <laughs> <laughs> then you're nominated again, and you win again. Then you're nominated again, and you win again. <laughs> and then what I'm fascinated is about the things I've heard you say about the next time you were nominated and then didn't win. Uh -huh. How you felt about that. It's great. That's the part that amazes me, it's but I great. think I understand, too. Oh, it's a monkey off your back. How, 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 no one can possibly keep up with that. Well, Julie Harris, I guess. <laughs> but maybe, the, I'm sure there were, I don't know the Tony history, but I'm sure there were times that she didn't win. Look at someone like Meryl Streep, you know, 13, 14 Oscar nominations. What I always say about the Tonys is you can't, it's not even like running for president. You can campaign, you right. know, there's nothing you can do. You don't nominate yourself. 
you can't go out and ca campaign and you can't vote for yourself. So all you can do <laughs> is just do your work, you yeah. know. Um, so it was more about, I think, everybody else's sort of expectation and, and what it meant, you know, if Audra, you know, when Audra loses, aha, well, she's, she, you know, her record right. is now tarnished. And right. for me, it was just, oh, okay. And I, I, I had the most fun I've ever, ha I've ever had that night at the Tonys. My <laughs> husband and I, it was like we were on our second date in, in college and just party hopped and didn't get home till six o'clock in the morning. Didn't realize at the time. We didn't know. It turns out I was about three weeks pregnant at the time. We didn't even know that, you know, but just had a grand time. So yeah. it just, it was, it was, it was the most fun I've ever had. And then winning again. Yeah. <laughs> so you were done with that whole thing of losing and now you're going to yeah. start winning them again. Yeah. That one, um, too, I didn't. That was for Raisin in the Sun. Raisin in the Sun. I just, there's, you know, what do you, what do you do? What do you say? You're, I mean, I was honored and I'm always honored and floored. But it is one of those things where you think, what am I, what, I guess I'm going to get hit by a bus when I walk outside because <laughs> I just don't know what else could happen. Yeah. You know, that I, it's in terms of how, what do you do when every dream you've ever had, you know, comes true. What do you do? Yeah. Um, you learn that there are other dreams to have. There, there is reality. There is, you know, also what, uh, as wonderful as those Tonys are, and it's incredible recognition, um, what's most important is that I have a body of work that I'm proud of, mm -hmm. um, that I continue to grow as an artist, that I fu am fulfilled as an artist, and um, that I have someone and something to come home, home to at night that makes it real. Because yeah. if you don't have that, it, and, and you desire that, I'm not saying everybody wants that, and you desire that, that can be a hard thing. And so none of it feels real for me unless I have my family and my close friends around me. That's what makes it all feel real and worth it. You yeah. know? Do you feel you have to accomplish anything in the world of concerts then? Because you've done everything that anyone could ever expect to do in theater, to win the Tony four times and all that, and with a long career still ahead of you, and yet you do the concerts. Yeah, well, of no, course. Would. But then you do the concerts and mm -hmm. all of that, walking out on Carnegie Hall stage for the first time. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. all of these big things happen next. <clears throat> do you set certain goals in that area, or is it a point in your life where you say, I'll try what I want, I'm free? Well, I think it, I am sort of trying what I want, but it's always about just continuing to grow. I don't want to ever, continue, I don't ever want to do anything that just feels sort of easy. And, um, well, not right now anyway, maybe when I get older. <laughs> um, but for me now, it's like, let's, let's do the absolute best that we can and let's continue to push ourselves. And if we, and if we should fall, remember, you know, I mean, whatever. But just knowing that, you know, you've tried as hard as you possibly can. And there's lots of different things that interest me. Well, know? then with that said, was it or was it not scary to walk into doing opera now? Yes, absolutely. So why? I mean, I guess the lazy part of me wants to know, then why do it? Why risk I, it? I love the piece. I love yeah. that piece. I've loved it since school. And it's talk about a challenge, you know, just you on the phone. You do two one-woman shows mm -hmm. put together mm -hmm. in this piece. Yeah, when we first signed on to this, it was just the one, and we were thinking, well, we got to figure out what a curtain raiser would be. And then David Gockley came up with the idea about Michael John around the same time that Ted Sperling and I were coming up with the idea. Um, and, but David Gockley came up with the idea on his own. He was with Houston Grand Opera. Yes, was he with Houston was Grand with Houston Opera Grand Opera now in San Francisco. And he went ahead and uh, commissioned Michael John. And so, you know, Michael John's not going to write, you know, just any old curtain raiser. He, he, he wrote quite a piece himself. And so um, the great thing about having Michael John's piece first was that that was a composer that I, I know. He's a composer I know like the back of my hand. I know his work. I know his style. Um, it gives me a chance to sort of calm down in front of the audience, believe it or not, before I have to then tackle something that I feel that I am not necessarily as familiar with. It's not as in my bones as 
um, La Voix Humaine is not as in my bones in terms of just n- knowing it in, in sort of a, a spiritual way. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a really great idea for me to have Michael John's piece first. To find true satisfaction, do you have to be challenged first? I think so. I think for me, yeah. Um, maybe it's that hyperactive thing going on. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I need to be challenged. Um, and I'm never satisfied, just not ever. Was there management agent, somebody saying to you, don't, you don't need to tackle, you don't need to try this because what if it doesn't work? What if somebody writes a bad review? You know, what if someone says, oh, she really couldn't do it? Did anybody? No. Every, my, the, the, the people I have in my life, I, I have surrounded myself with people that are um, very smart and they're not sycophants by any stretch of the imagination. When I fall on my face, they say, well, you fell on your face. They don't say, oh, darling, darling, it was wonderful, it was wonderful, really, it was wonderful. <laughs> you, no, they say, you, you, you fell, you fell. All right, what do we do now? You know, and that's important to me. So everybody said, yeah, it's a big deal here. Yeah, you could really, you could really blow it here, but we understand that you want to do it. You know, even my TV agents and people like that, who's like, you, okay, so you're booked through what year? We can't, <laughs> you can't do anything until 2009? Okay, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, we totally understand. And they don't abandon me. They all come. It's like, oh, the opera thing's cool, you know? But So tell me, in, in the last two seconds, we have left the mm-hmm. sense of pride when that curtain finally went down after the opera premiere. How did you feel? I felt like I... I have, I have miles to go before I sleep, but I've started the journey. Well, and I thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thank Truly you. a pleasure. Thank you. Audra McDonald. Thanks. Order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.